with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this time of worship. It's good to be here with you. There are, um, announcement-wise, uh, first of all, a couple of inserts in the bulletin today. Uh, one that has to do with uh, the Easter offering, One Great Hour of Sharing, which we'll be receiving next Sunday. And the other insert is the order form uh, to contribute toward Easter lilies and or outside landscaping. So um, that's there for your information and, and uh, to respond as, as you're able. I do want to uh, share that uh, right after the service today, we'll be having a soup luncheon in the Fellowship Hall. And I think there's, what, a dozen or more different kinds of soup back there? Thirteen, okay. And uh, you don't want to miss this, okay? This is a real treat. So, uh, you know, please, please, as you're able, uh, stick around for that, and we'll enjoy this uh, lunch together and, and some fellowship time and some good food, too. Um, yeah, now the folks that are run, running the show back here ask that, uh, that you go into the fellowship hall as you go through this door toward the fellowship hall don't go in the the two doors that are right in front of you but turn right and go into the single door which is sort of on the main street end because as you go in that door then you'll go to the left and the tables are lined up and everything and i'm sure there'll be somebody standing out there to to maybe direct traffic a little bit but don't go in as you normally would go to the right there's a single door there so is that correct okay great pick up a tray all right okay <laughs> Um, just a reminder that this Friday is a good Friday, and so we will uh, have our sanctuary open all day from 9 to 5 for just individual prayer meditation, and, and you're invited to come by for uh, as long as you like, if you're able to, and, and enjoy that uh, time of uh, quiet and stillness. Next Sunday, of course, is Easter Day, and uh, please note information about the egg hunt on the playground at 10 o'clock, and this is for children of all ages, so children, grandchildren, you know, whatever, uh, they're, everyone's invited, and it begins at 10, be sure to bring a basket, uh, every, everybody's supposed to bring their own basket for that, and that's next Sunday. Our postlude today is a seated postlude. So after the benediction and we sing the uh, response to the benediction, I'll invite you to, to be seated for this. Uh, it's a choral uh, postlude, so the choir will be singing, so we'll be seated for that. And as always, please keep in your prayers, all the folks on our prayer list. Um, are there other announcements? Anything anybody needs to share? Okay. Well, again, a welcome to you all. Welcome to our time of worship. Let's take time now during the prelude to center ourselves before God and prepare for worship.
gathered here to worship God. As you're able, please stand now for our responsive call to worship. Here, we prepare ourselves for the week that is holy, yet filled with unholy acts, words, thoughts. In this week of journey, we may at times lose our way, while at other times we will find hope hidden in our hearts. We will try to follow Jesus in the days to come, sustained by the word of grace and life. Blessed is the one who opens the heart of God to us. Blessed is the one who comes and gives us new life. Let us worship God. Gracious God, we come before you to worship. We lift our hearts to you in praise. You call us by name. You lift our weary hearts. You deepen our faith. You give us eyes to see your blessings all around us. You are the 
giver of peace. You are the source of joy. You are the whisper of love that speaks to us in the stillness. Oh God, we love you and ask you to help us now to worship you in spirit and in truth. This we pray in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. join together now in a time of honesty before God. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Trusting the boundless grace of God, let us pray together. God, when we started this journey of faith, it seemed like a fun idea. Walk the road with Jesus, we thought. But the journey has had many difficult times. Our spirits have been challenged and tried. We want everything to be wonderful. We want you to conquer whatever threatens us and our peace. Simply put, we want you to do what we want you to do. No questions asked. Have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us for placing our fears and ignorance before your love. Release us from our panic and mistrust. Help us place our lives solely in your hands. Show us the ways we can serve others, and through serving them, serve you. Lord, hear our prayers. God's love can dry your tears. God's mercy can set you back on your feet. God's peace can settle your worries. So trust in God and believe the good news of the gospel. In Christ Jesus, you are and always have been and always will be forgiven. Amen.
Thank you, choir. I'd like to invite children to come to the front of the sanctuary now for the children's sermon. How you doing? Good. Good, good. You know what today is? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, you're right. Why do we call it Palm Sunday? Because of the palm leaves. Because of the palm leaves, that's right. When, when Jesus rode uh, into Jerusalem, the people were standing, you know, along the street, and they had palm branches, and they were waving them. And uh, I kind of made some, some artificial palm branches. Would you like one for each hand? Okay. Do you know what they said? What, what word were they using? Do you know? They were saying, Hosanna. Hosanna. Do you know that word? Well, it's not an English word. It's a Hebrew word. And it means, Lord, save us. Okay? But we don't speak Hebrew, do we? Okay. So we're going to substitute something. Instead of saying Hosanna, we're going to say, thank you, God. Okay? And I thought it would be fun if we thought about some of the things that we're thankful for. And then we'll just say it. And then after we name it, we'll wave our palm branches and say... Thank you, God. Okay? You want to practice one? All right. What's something you're thankful for? Mm -hmm. My family. Your family. Okay. So you ready? My family. Wave them up high. Just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Louder than that. Thank you, God. Oh, come on. Really louder. Thank you, God. Pretty good. All right. All right. What else? What else are we thankful for? How about uh, our church? Okay. All right. Our church. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I can't hear you. Thank you, God. All right. Good. What else? How about air and water and food? And sunshine. And sunshine. Okay. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You want to get up and do it? Okay, let's stand up and do it. Anybody else want to come up here and do this? <laughs> Okay, let's do a couple more. What are you thankful for? Uh, what? No ideas? Any ideas? Music? Music. Okay, how about music? You like music? Thank you, God, for music. Hey, okay, all right. What else? One more thing. Friends. Friends, okay. Thank you, God, for friends. Thank you, God. Hey, okay. All right. Very good. You're good at this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Palm Sunday, uh, they were happy about Jesus, and they were saying, Hosanna. And we were saying, thank you to God, because God gives us all good things, right? Okay. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for Jesus, thank you for Jesus who loves us, who loves us and, is always with us. and is always with us. Thank you for all the good things, thank you for all the good things that, you give us. that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. I know how to fix that because I'm a highly trained professional. <laughs> the scripture reading is from the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version today. Listen for God's word to you. When Jesus had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. <clears throat> 
If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. <clears throat> as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. <clears throat> There's a lot in that passage. This old Palm Sunday scripture passage is a whole lot to preach on. Today, though, I just want to call your attention mainly to four words in what I read. Four words that, to me, seem to, to sort of jump off the page. The words, the Lord needs it. Jesus tells his disciples that if anybody asks why you're untying the colt, just say, the Lord needs it. And sure enough, when they're untying it, the, the colt's owners ask, why are you untying the colt? And what do they say? They say, the Lord needs it. Now, I think in a way it, it may seem a little odd to, to consider the fact that Jesus ever needed anything. Are you struck by that at all? The notion that Jesus needed something? I mean, he's the one who could heal people, right? He's the one who could walk on water, the one who raised children from the dead, the one who took five loaves of bread and two fish and turned them into enough to feed 5,000 people. What does he need, right? He needed things. Like what? But that's what he says to them. The Lord needs it. Tell them the Lord needs it. In, in Mark's version of this story, Jesus tells the disciples to say, the, Lord's need, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. So you get this idea that in Mark that Jesus is, is borrowing the colt. I'm sure he was borrowing it, even though in Luke um, that's not mentioned. He just needed it for a while, and so he borrowed it. He needed it. When you think about it, have you ever noticed how many things Jesus borrowed over his lifetime, over his ministry? Seems like he's always borrowing something, and not just a Palm Sunday cult. He was born in a borrowed stable, right? Without the loaves and fish that he borrowed from a young boy, the feeding of the 5,000 never would have happened. He borrowed homes to meet in, to sleep in. He borrowed boats to sit in and push out from the shore and teach or to cross to the other side of the lake. The upper room where he met with his disciples for the Last Supper, it was a borrowed space. And even the tomb where he was buried was borrowed. It was someone else's tomb. And if, if you follow that line of thinking, then, then you begin to get the sense that really, actually, his very life was on loan from God. 
We could say that Jesus' life was was on loan from God, and and Jesus clearly never really uh, thought of his life as being his own. He always knew that his life belonged to God. It was on loan from God, the God who would powerfully give it back to him on the day that we call Easter. Maybe this is a different way of thinking about Jesus because we usually think of Jesus as a giver, as one who gave to others. And indeed, he did. He gave a lot. He gave advice. He gave healing. He gave peace and friendship. He gave even his own life. And yet, throughout his earthly ministry, he, he constantly borrowed things. He held things very loosely. I wonder why. Actually, I do not wonder why. I mean, what else is an itinerant rabbi going to do? He couldn't have done what he did if he were tied down to a lot of baggage, right? Jesus was always on the go. He had to hold things loose. But really, I think there's, there's even more to it than that. I think it was partly that, but I think there was more because I think Jesus' attitude and his teachings about possessions aren't just describing the lifestyle of a wandering teacher. I think there's a, a bigger, a, a broader lesson here. Isn't it that Jesus is teaching the truth and then living the truth that all we have is borrowed? Borrowed from God. Jesus pretty much ignored the conventional wisdom about owning and possessing and lending and borrowing because he knew that none of us really has any possessions. Think about it. What do you own? I mean, what do you really own? Or are the things that you might claim to own really things that have been loaned to you for a time? Things that have been entrusted to you for a time? Things that, that God has entrusted to you and you are called to exercise responsible stewardship of those things. But own? I mean, outright own? Are you sure? I don't know. What does it mean to own something? What does that really mean? Maybe it's more like everything is on loan from God. Everything, even life itself, even our lives, on loan from God. I think that's how Jesus saw it. So, in fact, he needed to borrow this colt for the ride into Jerusalem because he didn't have a cult of his own. But that's how he lived, isn't it? He lived lightly. He lived freely. He lived unencumbered by things. He doesn't seem to, to embrace our concepts about ownership. Ownership, if he ever used that word, was always assigned ultimately to God to the divine owner of all that you and I might presume to call mine. Like my house, or my wealth, my stocks, my retirement portfolio, my stuff, my money, my way or the highway. We use the word my so much that it's interesting to know that it's a pretty rare word in the Bible. And this kind of my thinking, this obsession with my this and my that, regrettably, it can't help but trickle over into church life, you know, where we often vote with our feet and our money when we don't get my way in my church, in my time, on my terms. This whole notion of my needs to be carefully thought about. 
In any case, today we begin Holy Week, the week of Jesus' passion and suffering and the cross. And it's worth, I think, remembering that this, this offering of Jesus' life for the sake of humankind is connected to his own understanding that everything in life we call our own is actually borrowed. Even Jesus' life was on loan from God. And Jesus' self-giving of his life is rooted in his conviction that life can be freely given. Life can be freely given because it's on loan from God in the first place. So, a while back in the news, there was a story about the emergency landing of a commercial passenger plane. The uh, pilot was about to land the plane full of passengers when he discovered that the, the wheels of the plane wouldn't go down. And so he radioed the control tower. And they told him to circle the airport and to dump all of the plane's fuel and then come in for a belly landing. And in the meantime, the ground crew would spray the runway with foam and line up ambulances and, and uh, emergency vehicles and fire engines and so forth. The pilot shared this information with everybody on the plane over the intercom and everybody braced and prepared themselves and the plane made the approach. It was a terrifying landing as the plane squealed along the runway, metal against concrete. But in the end, everybody survived. Nobody was hurt. And as the passengers left the plane, the pilot said to one of them, we made it, we made it through. So remember, the rest of your life is extra. To which the passenger responded, no, it's all extra. Every single day from the beginning is all extra. So I'm intrigued by those words, the Lord needs it. And I would invite and encourage you to reflect on those words between now and next Sunday. These, 